This video was sponsored by Audible. It's a dark, foggy, moonlit night. And the hounds of hell are hot on your tail. As you scramble and dash through the forest underbrush, a shadowy silhouette rears above the landscape in front of you. The crumbling edifice of a gigantic, rundown mansion. With barely a second glance and no time for second thoughts, you throw open the ancient wooden double doors and dive inside, bolting the entryway behind you. And as your eyes slowly adjust to the palatial, candlelit interior, the proverbial voice of God echoes across your subconscious psyche. You have once again entered the world of survival horror. Good luck. Survival horror. This was a small, seemingly innocuous bit of English that honestly wasn't really out of place with the rest of the first Resident Evil's somewhat stilted translation. The genesis of the phrase is simple enough. In its original Japanese incarnation as Biohazard, survival horror was a tagline featured heavily in the game's pre-release promotional media. Survival horror, biohazard. But, you know, calling it English feels a bit uncharitable, because the phrase survival horror has an excellent does-what-it-says-on-the-label quality that sums up Resident Evil damn near perfectly in two words. This is a horror action game with a strong emphasis on play mechanics and resource management. Game design that, to this day, is still regarded as the essential core of the survival horror genre. The original Resident Evil on PS1 was a surprise smash hit phenomenon that almost no one saw coming like this, selling more than 5 million copies worldwide and sparking the creation of one of the most legendary series in all of video gamesdom. And so, thanks to its opportune inclusion when the game released outside of Japan, the phrase survival horror quickly became both the popular shorthand and the universally agreed upon moniker for the new subgenre of modern 3D action gaming that Resident Evil almost single handedly pioneered. Almost. Because considering how the first Resident Evil has become synonymous with the golden age of survival horror and the genre's legacy writ large, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this game was the patient zero and originator of the survival horror genre. But just like the best haunted house stories, the horror goes so much deeper than you know. Resident Evil was, no doubt, the apotheosis of many different game design trends that gave fixed shape to what we now call survival horror. At the same time though, there were quite a few games that had already featured this very combination of action, horror and survival gameplay in the years before Shinji Mikami and Hideki Kamiya first linked up at Capcom. And so, this is exactly the idea behind this new series I'm launching here. We will dig into the hidden history of one of the medium's most important and influential genres and the games that inspired it. Some of these games are already fairly well known and well regarded in their own merits, like the 1992 Lovecraft em up adventure Alone in the Dark. Others are far more obscure and esoteric, like the 1989 action platformer Project Firestart, or the 1987 shooter RPG Sense and War of the Dead. But all these seemingly different experiences share a core emphasis on the interplay between mechanical mastery, resource management, and the use of horror themes to subvert player expectations, keep them constantly under pressure and on the back foot. Some of them served as direct blueprint material for Mikami and his team at Capcom when creating the first Resident Evil, and others' influence can be felt more indirectly, like a distant flap of a looted butterfly. But one way or another, these are the games that make up the origins of survival horror. Alright, before we continue, a short interlude from the sponsor of this video, which is Audible. I don't believe there are many who've never heard of Audible at this point. It's pretty much the place for audiobooks, audio dramas, and podcasts with an absolutely massive selection ranging from the biggest bestsellers to works of small independent authors and everything in between. 
I've recently been revisiting the Wheel of Time saga by Robert Jordan, an absolute fantasy milestone that inspired so many important pieces of media, such as the Legacy of Cain saga, for instance, to give just one example. The first two novels, The Eye of the World and The Great Hunt, are now available on Audible narrated by Rosamund Pike herself, who portrays none other than Moraine in the TV show adaptation, and her narration performance is seriously so fantastic that it made re-listening to these books an absolute joy. The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. The cool thing is that as a new member, you can start an Audible membership for 30 days for free, you can cancel at any time, and you'll get one free audiobook with it to start. So you can jump right into the Wheel of Time series, for instance, or listen to any other audiobook of your liking, or choose from a vast selection of audiobooks and podcasts you can listen to for free as an Audible member. So let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash Ragnaroks or text Ragnaroks to 500-500. So thanks a lot again, and now I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. For this inaugural episode, I want to cover a very special title. The game that is, more so than any other, the main source material for the original Resident Evil. So much so that Resident Evil was actually first conceived as an out-and-out -out remake of this very game. We are talking about the legendary 1989 Japanese-only Famicom horror JRPG that kicked off a genre renaissance and, this is no exaggeration, forever changed gaming as an art form. Be it ever so humble, there is no place like Sweet Home. Decades before it would serve as the core building blocks of the original Resident Evil and the wider survival horror genre, the 1989 Famicom Japanese RPG Sweet Home was already breaking important ground for video games. While game movie tie-ins were certainly already a thing in the 1980s, Sweet Home was the first time in media history that a game and film were created and released parallel to each other. In a very real way, Sweet Home was one of the first and most important experiments in what we now know as transmedia, where a story is told simultaneously through multiple mediums like film, TV, books, comics and games. Chalk it up to Japan once again being massively ahead of the curve when it comes to pop cultural and storytelling trends. Sweet Home, the Famicom. The film Sweet Home, released in 1989 alongside its Famicom counterpart, has few pretenses and is actually pretty much exactly what it sounds like. A slow burn thrill ride through a literal haunted house, featuring killer practical effects, gruesome J-horror imagery and a deeply surrealistic story. The mad pursuit of artistic perfection by an infamous painter, Ichiru Mamiya, has led to the horrific disintegration of his family and the poltergeist haunting of the dilapidated expanses of Mamiya Mansion, aka the titular Sweet Home. And hey, the vagaries of copyright law combined with the fact that it never was officially licensed for distribution outside of Japan means that right this moment, Sweet Home, the movie, is available to watch for free on YouTube. Links in the description. This was one of the first films directed by none other than Kiyoshi Kurosawa, the David Cronenberg of Japan who would later become world famous for the 1997 psychological thriller Cure and the 2001 techno-horror extravaganza Cairo, released in the West as Pulse, which is, if I may be so bold, one of the finest and also one of my absolute personal favorite horror films of all time. Quote me on that. <laughs> The story sees a hapless film crew visit the abandoned Mamiya mansion in search of the painter's legendary lost frescoes, in hopes of being the first to publish the paintings as part of a documentary about the reclusive artist's life and times. Do you ever prep? What's the prep? Shitty house? Spooky sounds? Ooh, is it haunted? But of course, it isn't long before mysterious and horrific happenings begin befalling the crew. Hauntings, hallucinations, demon possession and murder most foul. The game Sweet Home hues closely to the story and themes of the film, which is no surprise considering that director Kurosawa and the film's executive producer Juzo Itami helped bridge the mediums by working as the executive producer and supervising producer of the game respectively. 
Indeed, from the very beginning, survival horror has been a genre defined as much by its connection to the cinematic arts as by its connection to the ludic. Sure, those pre-rendered backdrops and fixed camera angles in Resident Evil were, in one sense, a technical workaround because 3D rendering was still in its infancy. But these iconic camera angles also speak to the cinematic aspirations that have been the beating heart of this genre from its very inception. The biggest divergences and departures between film and game stem from, what else, the gameplay. Rather than the more straightforward action shooter format we've come to expect from survival horror games, Sweet Home on the old Famicom most closely resembles old, old school, menu driven Japanese RPGs like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. There is a top-down overworld to navigate, treasures and secrets to discover, and of course, random battles, pulling you out of the exploration phase out of nowhere in which you'll take turns trading blows with the mansion's deadly and otherworldly denizens. Now, it is well-established gaming lore at this point that the PlayStation 1 Resident Evil was indeed first conceived as a straight-up remake of Sweet Home. Shinji Mikami's initial concept pitch was for a fully 3D, first-person perspective reimagining of the original Famicom game. You can even hear the game's lineage in the Japanese promotional media for the first Resident Evil, which makes use of a reorchestrated version of the Sweet Home battle theme. Not to mention the fact that Kiyoshi Kurosawa himself was brought on as a supervising producer for the development of the Sweet Home remake that became Resident Evil. But as the realities of development on the brand spanking new PlayStation hardware wore on, certain compromises had to be made in order to realize the team's vision. The perspective was famously switched from first to third person, and design for the rooms and backgrounds dropped the real-time 3D environments in favor of pre-rendered stilts. The scope of the game shifted alongside these changes as well, which is ultimately why the Sweet Home remake was rechristened as Biohazard in Japan and Resident Evil everywhere else. Sweet Home is a game that, at the time of this video's release, is more than three decades old. But playing it today, it's still crystal clear just how much of this game's DNA ended up being transposed into Resident Evil and survival horror writ large further driving home the fact that this game is one of the most influential horror games ever made. You only have to play this game for about 5 minutes before you'll be treated to Sweet Home's iconic door opening cutscene, rendered lovingly in the Famicom's 56 color palette. This moment was lifted almost beat for beat by the original Resident Evil and spruced up into beautifully pre-rendered shots. And perhaps the most iconic shot of the original Resident Evil. The George Romero in the mirror camera pan where the zombie turns around to reveal its half-rotten face and half-eaten victim. This was also a direct reimagining of Sweet Home's horrific reveal of the psycho and madman enemy types. And just like Resident Evil, Sweet Home tells much of its story and backstory through the use of diegetic diaries, notes and blood scrawl script you'll come across during your journey, best immersive sim style. Paying careful attention to these notes, and taking copious notes of your own, is the only way to fully come to grips with Sweet Home's uber macabre narrative. It's also an exemplar of one of the most important game design staples of survival horror thanks to its absolutely teeth-grindingly restrictive inventory system. Each character in your party of five only has room for one key item, one weapon and two inventory slots. This demands careful planning and a purposeful playstyle in order to complete the game's many puzzles. You will often encounter progress blocks that require a key item several rooms away, or even on the other side of the mansion. And so you'll spend much of your time crisscrossing and backtracking across the expansive mansion grounds, swapping items as you go. But all the while, the random battles will continue to chip away at your limited pool of resources bit by bit, while hordes of horrific zombies, spirits and assorted creepy crawlies assail you from all sides. This all makes exploration of the mansion a nerve-wracking prospect, even in the best of circumstances. Sure, these sprites and monster designs don't have quite the same impact as they did in 1989, as we observe with eyes oversaturated by decades of hyper-realistically staged video game ultra-violence. But just imagine playing this one of the tiny handful of actual true horror games in existence at the time as an impressionable 12-year-old. 
Indeed, to that end, Sweet Home features a handful of rudimentary cinematic sequences that, in our modern gaming parlance, can fairly be termed jump scares. Yeah, it's maybe one of the earliest examples of scripted jump scares executed in a video game. Even something as innocuous as examining an object in the environment can result in a bone-chilling surprise for the player. This game was, far and away, some of the most horrifying shit you could ever hope to see on an 8-bit system in the late 1980s. Which is absolutely and 100% why Nintendo of America refused to touch it with a 10-foot pole, and the game frankly never stood a snowball's chance of being localized outside of Japan. Like seriously, are you even allowed to show this much blood and guts on the NES? So far, I've talked about the similarities and lines of continuity between Sweet Home and Resident Evil. And yeah, this stuff is basically catnip to deep lore horror nerds, which, if you're watching this video, there's a good chance you might count yourself in this illustrious company. But as interesting as all this stuff is, it's also worth pointing out just how excellent Sweet Home is on its own merits, independently of the it's the proto-Resident Evil appellation that is the elephant in the room around pretty much every discussion around this game. Because yeah, Sweet Home is a hugely effective and compelling fusion of the RPG adventure genres, which basically blazed its own trail and was unlike anything that had been released before it. And it's the sort of mechanically dense play experience that any survival horror fan, or even anyone with an appreciation for retro games can enjoy today, some three decades since it first came out. As the player plums into the depths of Mamiya Mansion, you're given total control over the configuration of the five members who make up your adventuring party. You can switch between each party member on the fly, combining them together in groups of two or three, or even having individual characters go solo and strike out on their own. But just as we know from every horror movie ever made, splitting up the party is a great way to get everyone six feet under in no time. So you'll definitely want to keep your crew in a tight formation, especially in the early going. Exploration and progression through Mamiya Mansion is solidly JRPG in its mechanics. You'll fight through menu-driven, turn-based random encounters and your characters will gain experience, level up and grow more powerful over time. You'll also find weapons scattered throughout the mansion grounds, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Regular weapons are all-around damage dealers, rune weapons are most effective against ghosts and spirits, and silver arms give you an edge against flesh and blood types like zombies, rabbit dogs and maniac killers. There's also a rudimentary magic system, where each character will accumulate prayer points as they explore and level up. In battle, the Prey command is essentially the game's magic equivalent. Selecting it will present you with a quick minigame where a bar fills and depletes, and you must time your button press in order to determine the strength of your prayer attack. Praying usually does more damage than a regular physical blow, and is extremely helpful in times when enemies use disabling or grappling attacks that take a party member out of the action. But beware, because your pool of prayer points is limited indeed, and not that easily replenished. Now, myself and many others have gushed extensively about this rare and painfully underused marriage of survival horror and JRPG turn-based combat. I've touched on this before in my videos on Kudelka and Parasite Eve. RPG mechanics these days may feel like a quirky outlier in survival horror pantheon, but Sweet Home stands as proof positive of how this genre hybrid served as the core inspiration for survival horror gameplay, especially when we're talking about the genre's early years. In a very, very real way, Sweet Home is where it all began. But the twist that elevates this game above other JRPGs of its era is in how each of your five controllable party members has their own unique item-derived abilities, and each of these are essential for solving puzzles and progressing through the mansion. Katsuo, dad and ringleader, has a lighter for illumination or burning down rope barriers. Emi, his daughter, is the master of unlocking, who can open any basic door. Asuka is the vacuum specialist who can hoover up progress blocking glass shards and also dust off the frescoes so they can be photographed and recorded by Taguchi, the team's shutterbug. And rounding out the group is Akiko, whose handy remedy kit can cure various poisons, curses and other encumbrances. So when one of your two to three person team bumps up against a puzzle you haven't solved yet, more often than not you'll need to switch away from your current adventuring party and bring along the character with the necessary skill or item for the situation. Photographing each fresco will reveal its own unique clue, which often points you towards a solution of a nearby puzzle. 
This means that uncovering the mansion's mysteries and progressing through the game requires effective back and forth switching between the characters who can uncover the solutions and the characters who can execute those solutions. Sometimes it's as simple as taking a key object from one room, traveling to an adjacent room and putting it in the proper spot. So far, so Resident Evil. But in other cases, you might realize that the key item you need is all the way on the opposite side of the mansion, raising a dilemma. Do you coordinate all five characters for yet another grueling trek across the estate grounds? Or do you form a smaller, one to two person team and try to hoof it there and back again? A much more efficient, but also much riskier gambit. Working in the player's favor here are the interconnected, does not open from this side doors that, when unlocked, create helpful shortcuts that aid in your traversal of the mansion. Opening these doors results in some wonderful aha moments when you realize how well the different sections of the mansion connect together, almost as though Sweet Home is a very early example of a, dare we call it, Metroidvania? The interlocking field of play, the extremely restrictive inventory system and the constant attrition of the random battles creates this beautiful escalating back and forth tension. The player is always juggling a handful of mini dilemmas and trying to make the most of their ever dwindling pool of resources, all while frantically beset on all sides by seemingly impossible odds. In other words, Sweet Home really and truly is pure survival horror in its most primordial form. And it's the kind of experience that's only possible thanks to the incredibly forward-thinking fusion of RPG, adventure and horror action mechanics. There are even randomly occurring rudimentary quick time events, a full decade before Shenmue came along and stole all the credit. Oh, hey, you! While exploring, a spirit or possessed object will occasionally come hurtling at you, threatening to deal extra damage to your lead character. You've only got a few moments to make the correct decision. Dive left, leap right, duck and cover, or close your eyes and pray. And you'll need to pay careful attention to the slow tick ticking down of your party's health, because Sweet Home features yet another twist that further complicates the limited party size and inventory system. Permadeath. That's right, when a party member dies, it's... So There are no phoenix downs, revive spells, or helpful church clergy to bring them back to life. They're gone for good. And once all five party members die, it's game over, man. Not only does each death take a big chunk out of your party's battle power, it adds another wrinkle on top. You lose access to that character's ability item, each of which are 100% necessary to complete the game. But don't worry, the game does give you alternatives. If Asuka dies with her vacuum, another character can pick up a broom and use it to the same effect, for example. Or if young Emmy perishes tragically, you'll need to locate a wire lockpick to replace her skeleton key. To their great credit, the designers planned the game's interlocking puzzles out really well, so that you're never put in a soft-locked, unwinnable position just because a character has died. But man, I speak from personal experience when I say that you really, really don't want to be put in this position, because the difficulty increases exponentially with each party member you lose. And the game's ending is determined by how many of your characters make it through to the end, which with the best and quote-unquote secret ending reserved for players who manage to reach it with their complete party intact. Again, this speaks to Sweet Home's status as the originator of the survival horror genre, right down to the willingness to dole out severe punishment to the players for sloppy play or for making an error in judgment. So losing a character is the perfect moment to rewind time a little and take full advantage of the game's generous save system. You can save your progress anywhere, anytime outside of battle. But you'll have to be careful here, because saving at the wrong moment absolutely can put you in an unwinnable position. You might find yourself stuck in an obscure corner of the mansion, low on HP, with no restoratives at hand and no hope of escape. And in times like this, your only choice is to start the game over from the very beginning. That is incredibly brutal and demoralizing stuff. They don't call it Nintendo hard for nothing. Sweet Home was a moderate success in Japan. It sold well and earned critical plaudits from the Japanese fandom and gaming press, many of whom felt that the game was actually superior to the film even. But as was previously mentioned, to this day Sweet Home has never seen an official release in English, or any other language for that matter. 
The game's ultra-gory imagery, combined with the low popularity of JRPGs in the West at the time, meant that there was very little chance that Nintendo of America would shoulder the expense of localization, especially for a text-heavy game like this. And so, thanks to those same vagaries of copyright law that make the film free to watch on YouTube right now, Sweet Home remains ensconced within the vaulted crypts of Nintendo's retro necropolis, where Shigeru Miyamoto reigns over their neglected IPs from atop a throne made of human skulls emerging only to issue blizzards of mafia-esque DMCA takedown notices. Of course, a game like Sweet Home is way, way too important for horror fans to leave it in the grasping clutches of a company like Nintendo. And so, this horror gaming progenitor became one of the very first high-profile Japan-only titles to receive a full fan translation, as part of the nascent ROM hacking and translation scene that rose up around emulation in the early 2000s. The translation team known as Gaijin Productions released a solid English translation patch in 2000, which was further refined and perfected by a ROM hacker known as The Siege in a definitive edition addendum patch released in 2016. The 2016 patch by Siege is generally agreed to be the preferred way to play the game in English, as it features an improved translation and a good handful of bug fixes besides. But there are some caveats here. In my own emulation experimentation with a patched version of the game, I found that most modern emulators cannot save your progress via the in-game menu. Once you turn the game off, your save file is erased. In my testing, the only modern emulator that was able to successfully save and load was MESEN, or MESEN, which thankfully offers both a standalone version and a plug-in core for RetroArch, so you're covered either way. But really, this is only a minor quibble, because the game works fine with using save states in any emulator you'd like. And save states are in most cases far more convenient to use than the built-in save function anyway. I've provided links to the MESEN emulator as well as the translation patch at romhacking.net, where you can use their helpful online tool to create your own English translation patch ROM of Sweet Home. Of course, emulation is only half the battle. This is an old-school, tough-as-nails JRPG, and bustling in unprepared almost guarantees you a one-way ticket to oblivion. So in lieu of the kind of step-by-step -step walkthrough that'd spoil all the fun, here are some pro-gamer tips gleaned from hours of struggle that will help you make it through a night in Mamiya Mansion yourself. If you want to skip them for your own completely untainted playthrough, feel free to jump ahead to the beginning of the next chapter in the timeline. So, tip number one. Write down the notes and fresco clues you uncovered during your journey, or take a photo with your smartphone, because they're essential to solving the game's many puzzles, and there's no in-game journal that keeps track of the clues you've found so far. Seriously, this is a game from an era where having the player take physical notes was not considered bad game design, but rather an engrossing part of uncovering the story mystery for yourself, making you part of the whole thing. Tip number two. It kinda goes without saying, but the party with two members should have the strongest weapons equipped, since they only get to make two attacks in a given battle turn. Reserve the B-tier weaponry for the three-person party, as they can dole out more damage per turn. Tip number three. You can only move a single party at a time, which means that when random battles occur, only three characters max can be in the fight initially. But by using the call command in battle, you can summon your other party members to join the fight. Not only does this allow you to fight with a powered-up complement of all five party members, but they'll also share in the XP gains, ensuring everyone getting more evenly leveled. Tip number four, once you have called your entire party to the same battle, using a single tonic will fully heal your entire team. Normally, using a tonic on the overworld is a waste because it only cures the character who uses it, while using it in battle will heal the two or three party members in combat, which is better, but still not optimal. By using Call to gather your team members in the same fight for healing, you can get the most out of each tonic, which will go a long way towards making exploration and combat more manageable. Make the most out of your resources. This is survival horror, after all. And lastly, tip number five, absolutely and positively abuse the hell out of the save system, or your emulator's save state function for that matter. There is a reason you're allowed to save anywhere, anytime, and spoilers, it's not because the game is trying to go easy on you. I'm gonna leave it here for tips, because biting yourself through this rustic jewel is an absolute pleasure, and I don't want to completely take the joy of discovery through the occasional instance of ludic suffering away from you. See, it's easy to feel like you're reaching for hyperbole when you describe Sweet Home to someone who has never played it. 
This game was so important and influential, your average chronically oversharing horror nerd could easily spend half an hour or more rattling off all the things that make this game such an incredible, avant-garde, damn near breathtaking game. <clears throat> But even just on its own merits, Sweet Home is a tour de force horror RPG experience that both broke the mold and created an entirely new gold standard in gaming. A high mark that would take yet another seven years to come to full fruition in Biohazard Resident Evil. Because here and now, in the light of 2022, it's plain to see that Sweet Home has stood the test of time as one of the all-time greatest origins of survival horror. Hey, thanks for watching. This was Origins of Survival Horror, a series on games that were full-blown survival horror titles preceding the first Resident Evil. I've got a handful of episodes planned for this one, so let's see how it goes, and we'll continue next time with the incomparable original Alone in the Dark. If this is your first video of mine, hey, I'm Ragnar, and on this channel I largely cover old games, horror games, indie games, and combinations thereof. Also, a very special thanks for the guest voiceover of the proverbial voice of God by the one and only Gianni Matragrano. Gianni, I hope you got a good impression when working together with me. So, yeah, what's your verdict? Ragnarok's evil. Uh, oh, all right, fifth, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's just, like, your opinion, man. Anyway, so hey, if you want to help me out with my work on this channel and everyone who participates in making these videos, you can pitch in over on my Patreon for crowdfunding. Even a small monthly donation goes a long way, so thank you for considering. As for my active patrons, thank you a great deal for your ongoing support, and a special thanks this time goes out to Ronan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Billy Lott, Shannon Blue, Ian Rhodes, Risha Griggs, Vasily Prokhorov, Disco Dwarf, Terraflops, Isabella Stoner, Laird Wackala, Gehennas, Kenan Ward, Thwagam, Chuck Taylor, Alex Popov, Maria Rios, Hippo Hobbly, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Neil Snowden, Casper Rom, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Agustin Ortega, Morgan Kay, Samantha, Serena Abramson, Jin Hansen, Lawrence E. Buben, Dana Rosa, Nineball9606, Lillen B, Kyle Lee, Baruga Dono, Sable Cowell, David Zelenak, Catherine Escobar, Aurora Melpomine Crescendo, Swiss Hackmod, Federico Rocha, The Spiral Architect, Thomas Bona, Chris C, Taleban, Dylan Labonte, Nikon the Brave, Kerry George, Matt Gretton, Uziel 1447, Max Cusari, Corey Marr, John Boring, Franz Johannes Feulner, Vincent Cavanaugh, Felix, Tabby, Louise Lane, Refkins and Triscuits, Nathan Gillick, Thomas Patrick Hooper, Terry Collins, Ember Wiggins, Daniela Alvarez, Giselle Almonte, Felix D, Boris Bugling, and Giselle. Until next time, ta-ta!